In previous videos, we've seen the idea of agents that make decisions about what action to perform uh, by using logical reasoning. And uh, the basic idea is that they prove the theorem to the effect that a particular action is the optimal action to perform, uh, given their beliefs. Well, there are many problems with this approach, uh, but one of the kind of conceptual problems that people have uh, is that it doesn't seem to resemble the way that we make decisions. And by and large, we seem to be pretty good decision makers. We do it every day of our lives. So uh, in this uh, video, what we're going to introduce is the idea of agents that make decisions in a way that intuitively, at least, seems to be a bit closer to the way that we make decisions uh, about what action to perform. And what we're going to talk about are practical reasoning agents. Now I emphasise these practical reasoning agents do have quite a lot in common with the kind of agent architectures that we've seen before, in particular the symbolic architectures. And the key commonality is that we still assume that they have some explicitly represented symbolic model of the environment, which we call their beliefs. But the actual process by which they make their decisions is not via explicit logical reasoning. Okay, so, well, what is practical reasoning? Uh, here is a quote from Michael Brackman. Practical reasoning is a matter of weighing conflicting considerations for and against competing options, where the relevant considerations are provided by what the agent desires, values, cares about, and what the agent believes. And practical reasoning is distinguished from theoretical reasoning. So roughly speaking, practical reasoning is reasoning that's directed towards action, whereas theoretical reasoning is reasoning that's directed towards beliefs. So the classic example of theoretical reasoning is reasoning of the kind, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. The effect of that reasoning, which is a classic example of logical reasoning, is to change your beliefs. It changes your beliefs uh, uh, about Socrates. That is, you take on board the belief that Socrates uh, is, is mortal. So practical reasoning is reasoning that's directed towards action. And there seem to be two components in the kind of practical reasoning that we engage in. And that we call those components deliberation and means ends reasoning. So the intuitively, the way to think about this is as follows. Every morning you wake up and you're lying in bed and you're thinking, what am I going to do with my day? What is it that I'm going to accomplish with my day? And you fix upon certain things that you want to accomplish. And that process is deliberation. Deciding what, it's, what it is that you want to achieve. What are the things that you're going to try to work towards? That's deliberation. But then once you've fixed upon those things, you've decided that these are the things you're going to try and achieve, you're faced with a problem. And the problem is, how do you actually achieve those? Uh, and so this process of figuring out how we're actually going to achieve them is called means-ends reasoning. So the means are the actions available at your disposal, the things that you can do, and the ends are the things that you want to accomplish. So means-ends reasoning means trying to figure out how you're going to perform actions so as to bring about uh, the ends. So the outputs of the deliberation process, after you've deliberated, the result of that is that you have what we'll call intentions, things that you want to accomplish. Um, intentions are very often called goals, and I'll very often uh, use that uh, terminology as well. The outputs of the means-ends reasoning process are plans, essentially sequences of actions. And the idea is that you perform that sequence of actions, and it ends up accomplishing your intention or your goal. So the outputs of the deliberation process are intentions. So let's ask ourselves what kinds of properties intentions might have. So this classification of the properties of intentions comes from Cohen and Lamech in 1990. So the first and most fundamental pro uh, property that intentions have is that they pose problems for agents. They pose problems for agents in that they force an agent to start to think about how am I going to achieve them. If you tell your flatmate that you're going to get up and go to university today, uh, at, at the start of the day, but he comes home in the evening and you're still lying in bed, you would, he would be inclined to say that you never actually had an intention to go to university in the first place. So when you say you've got an intention to do something, you've got to devote resources to it. You've got to work towards it. Okay? It poses a problem for you. You've got to start to try to figure out how it is that you're going to achieve it and actively work towards it. 
The second property that they have is that they provide a filter for adopting further intentions. So if you decide, if you choose to decide uh, that you're going to go to university today, then that precludes all the other alternatives. You can't go to the beach, you can't go to the pub, you can't climb a mountain. All those other possible intentions are ruled out. You've got this intention to be to the university, so you've got to plan around that intention. That's there, you can only take on board other intentions which are consistent with that. Agents track the success of their intentions and they're inclined to try again if their attempts fail. Well, this just means, you know, if you're trying to get to university and you plan to do this by catching a bus and the bus doesn't turn up, well, what are you going to do? You're going to try and get a taxi, you're going to run, you're going to cycle, you're going to develop some alternative means of getting to the university. You're not just going to give up. Intentions are sticky and they push you to try to accomplish them. Intentions are also related to other mental states, and in particular, they're related to beliefs. So how are they related to beliefs? Well, for example, uh, agents believe their intentions are possible. Okay, uh, if you have an intention to go to the university, then you must believe there is at least some chance that you're going to succeed with it. Uh, and these next two properties, roughly speaking, say that uh, with the following wind, if all goes well, then you believe you will succeed with your intentions. You don't believe that you're going to fail. So you can plan around the assumption that your intentions are going to succeed. So intentions are related to other mental states like beliefs. Agents believe their intentions are possible, and roughly speaking, they think if all goes well, they will succeed with their intentions. The last property that we're going to talk about uh, is what's called the side effect problem. And the issue is as follows. Suppose you have an intention to go to the dentist, okay? And you know that necessarily, as a consequence of going to the dentist, you're going to suffer pain. The question is, do you intend to suffer pain as well? That is, do you intend all the consequences of your intentions? Uh, and this is called the package deal problem, the side effect problem. And roughly speaking, the general consensus is no, you don't intend all the side effects, all the consequences of your intentions. Okay, intentions are stronger than desires. Here's another quote from Michael Brackman. My desire to play basketball this afternoon is merely a potential influencer of my conduct this afternoon. It must vie with other relevant desires before it's settled what I will do. In contrast, once I intend to play basketball this afternoon, the matter is settled. I normally need not continue to weigh the, weigh the pros and cons when the afternoon arrives. I just normally proceed to execute my intentions. So desires are different from intentions because desires are potential influences of, of action, whereas intentions are direct influences of action. One other important difference is that we don't require that desires are logically consistent. It's perfectly possible to entertain a whole bunch of desires which are completely incompatible with one another. But the intentions that we choose for a rational agent, we require that those intentions are logically consistent. Let's just say something about means ends reasoning. So means ends reasoning, the process of figuring out how are you going to accomplish your intentions. And the output of means ends reasoning is a plan. And a plan is just a program. That's all it is. It's a sequence of actions. Do this, then do this, then do this. So the intention is to be at the university for a lecture. The plan involves walking to the bus stop, catching a bus, getting off the bus at the other end, and so on. It's a sequence of actions which is executed by an agent. And a means ends reasoner, a planning system, takes as input three things. It takes a goal, the intention that's going to be achieved, the thing that you want to accomplish, the state of the environment, your beliefs about what the world looks like now, and then the means at your disposal, the possible actions that you have that you can use within your plan. And then the planner has to figure out an appropriate sequence of actions, an appropriate plan, an appropriate program using these actions which, when executed from this state, will accomplish this intention. So practical reasoning consists of two processes. Deliberation, the results of which are intentions. Means-ends reasoning, the results of which are plans.